hours. Tonight, our message is a serious one, and I've already asked you to pray for light and humility. We're going to tell you who changed the Sabbath, and I think you ought to know. I want to say before I begin that God's truth is never sent to embarrass anyone. It's always sent to enlighten. Amen. I want to say something further, too. Christians are never against people, but they must be against false systems which enslave people. Amen. With that said, I want to point out to you that the devil's purpose is to counterfeit truth. And everything God gives for the good of man, the devil gives a counterfeit. That's why you have a choice. The Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll give him a wife. The devil said, try common law, shacking up, playing the field, adultery. The Lord said, of all the trees you may freely eat except one. The devil said, eat that one. Eat that one. And the Lord gave the Sabbath to Adam and Eve, not to the Jews, to Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And the devil came along and said, oh, forget his day, the first day of the week. Choose that one. And all kinds of excuses have come up as to why they do it. And that's why I had to preach this sermon. Beloved, if you want to do wrong, you may. Is that clear? You may. But don't try to make an excuse for it. Don't try to blame God for it. Amen. And it's not God's fault that we have not known the truth. God in His grace has finally brought it. Now we have thoroughly identified the true Sabbath in both the Old and the New Testaments. I'm going to read just one section of the New Testament to identify it again as we begin tonight. In the book of St. Mark, what book did I say? And I'm going to chapter 15 and I'm going to read verse 42 and I want you to listen. Mark 15:42 says, And now when the evening was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of, by the way, Mark was written almost 30 years after Christ had died and gone back to heaven. If that's clear, would you say amen? Now, if anything had been changed, at least in 30 years' time, Mark should have known. What do you say? Now listen. It says, because it was evening, the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for, for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Then we go down and we read verse uh, 46. And he bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph beheld where he was laid. Chapter 16, verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And you know what happened. They found Jesus had risen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is as clear as the nose on my face. He died on good what? The Jews called it the preparation, and the Bible says, the day before the Sabbath. Then we all know he arose on Easter what? The first day of the week. And the Bible says when that happened, the Sabbath was P-A-S-T. What does that spell? Past. Now that's clear. There's nothing to debate. That's clear. Now, beloved, who changed the Sabbath or who tried to? I'm going to suggest something to you, and I wish very seriously that you'd write down all these texts as I give them to you and uh, read them at home. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself. Did God do it? Psalms 89, 34. God said, My covenant will I not break, 
nor alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth. Amen? Alter means change or adjust. If you buy a dress and it's too tight, you alter it, don't you? You change it and make it fit. God said, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is going out of my lips. And in Exodus 20, verse 1, as the commandments are introduced, the Bible says, God spake all these words, saying. God spoke how much? God himself. He allowed prophets to do most of his speaking. But when it came to the law, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God spoke that. And God said, Thou shalt not make graven images. Thou shalt not take my name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Those are the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says God spoke all of them. And now we read, God said, I will not break my covenant, nor alter the thing that is going out of my lips. If that's clear, would you say amen? amen. Now, one text is enough for truth, but I like to give ample evidence. So write down Malachi 3, 6. I am the Lord, I change not. He precedes the latter part with the first part. Why don't you change? Because I'm the Lord. I do it right the first time. Would you say amen out there? Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15. I'm quoting it verbatim. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Sounds like God didn't do it. Let's read one more, First Chronicles 17, 27. Thou blessest, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. In making the Sabbath, God rested, he blessed it, and he sanctified it. Would you say amen? And the Bible says, Thou blessest, and it shall be blessed forever. So we must conclude tonight that God the Father never changed his law. Well, then what about Jesus? Some people say, well, maybe he did in the New Testament dispensation. I'd like to read to you from the New Testament. When Jesus came in John 4, 34, he said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Would you say amen out there? In Luke 4, 16, the Bible says, He came to Nazareth, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus had a custom of going to church on the Sabbath. Amen? Custom means habit. He did it regularly. Matthew 5, and beginning with verse 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, till, verse 18, Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one, break how many? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, that means the one you consider to be the most inconsequential. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's clear. In Matthew 24, Jesus was giving signs for the destruction of Jerusalem. He told his people, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, that's the sign. And when you see it, flee from wherever you are. If you're on the housetop, don't even come down. Flee from wherever you are. And then he said in verse 20 of Matthew 24, Jesus said, Pray that your flight be not in the wintertime, neither on the Sabbath day. Beloved, Christ did not want them to break the Sabbath by having to pack up and run on the Sabbath day. 
By the way, the Christians prayed and they left on a Wednesday in October. Would you say amen out there? But Christ was looking 40 years into the future when he saw in vision the destruction of Jerusalem. He was describing events 40 years after his resurrection and still he said, respect the Sabbath. Say amen. <laughs> All right, Jesus didn't do it. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. If you want to know what Paul is talking about, read verse 4 and 7. Say amen. amen. All right, Jesus didn't do it. In Luke 16, 17, Jesus said, It is easier. It is what? It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the Lord to fail. A tittle in the Hebrew character is like the crossing of a T. Not even the crossing of a T can fade away until heaven and earth pass. And as I've told you before, if you ever get to hearing somebody say God's law is done away with, go out and look up and see if heaven's still there. And then kick the ground. See if the earth is still there. If it's there, God's still on the throne, and the law is still together. Would you say amen out there? John 15, 10. There are people who say Jesus didn't keep the law. You ought not say that about the Lord, because whoever doesn't keep the law is sinning. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. And if you say Christ didn't keep the commandments, you're calling him a sinner. And anybody who calls him that is committing blasphemy. Amen. But in John 15, 10, Jesus said, Keep my commandments even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Amen. So God didn't do it and Jesus didn't do it. Now let's see if the disciples did it. In Acts chapter 20, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. You might expect Peter to keep the Sabbath, but Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. In Acts 20 and verse 27, Paul says, I have declared unto you all the counsel of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if Paul went over all that God required, why didn't he tell us about a new day? And I'm sincere. All you got to do is find me one scripture, and I'll keep any day that scripture says. If you don't believe it, find the scripture. Now, don't bring me a pamphlet or a mimeograph paper. I'm not going to listen to that. Bring me a text of Scripture that tells me that he did away with the Sabbath and ordained the first day of the week. I will join a first day church this coming Sunday. If you don't believe it, bring one text. Just one. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm trying to get you to think. It takes a lot of nerve to say something like that unless you know the Scriptures. Unless you know God. Now, let's go on. In Acts 13, I want to read to you, verse 14, the Bible speaks, and this is what it says. Acts 13 and verse 14. I have it now. Listen. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came unto Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. So here, the apostles were going to church on the Sabbath. Somebody heard that once and said, oh, that's only because they wanted to meet with the Jews. So I've got another text. Before we go to it, let's read verse 42 of this same chapter. And, now, and it says, and when the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Amen. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? On the Sabbath, the Gentiles said, look, the Jews heard it, teach us. And the next Sabbath, the whole town came. All right, let's read one more, Acts 18, 4. This is what the Bible says there. Listen, it says, and he, this is Paul, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Greeks. Would you say amen? Not just Jews, Gentiles too. Let's see if we can find one more. And if these disciples changed it, I'm ready to change. Acts chapter 17 and verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Jesus went as his manner was. Paul had a manner, and Paul was not even a Christian when Jesus went back to heaven. 
So if anybody should have been straight about the change, it should have been Paul, who was not even with the disciples until Christ had gone to heaven three and a half years. Would you say amen? So God didn't change the Sabbath, and I've proved it. Christ didn't do it, and I've proved it. The disciples didn't do it, and I've proved it. The question is, who did? I want you to write down Daniel chapter 7. And you're going to read in Daniel chapter 7 something very, very strange if you've not read it before. You're going to read about a vision that Daniel had. And in that vision, he saw some beasts. Some what? And if you read Daniel and the Revelation, you find a lot of funny-looking animals, symbols. And I'm going to show you what they mean from the Bible. You don't have to guess. But in Daniel chapter 7, it will surprise you perhaps to know that hundreds of years before Christ was born, the prophecy came that a power would arise that would do what we're talking about. Now in Daniel chapter 7, we have this uh, beast power introduced. And I don't have time to read the whole thing to you, but I just want to introduce it by beginning with verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The word diverse simply means different. They were not all alike. It says the first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised itself on one side. Then it, verse 6, after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, as a fourth, third beast. And then, verse 7 says, after this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. And strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. God gave these men these powerful visions of great beasts. Now, why did God use these beasts? First of all, we've got to see what a beast is. I'm going to read verse 17 of chapter 7. It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. That shall arise out of the earth. Would you say amen out there? A beast represents a king and his kingdom. That's all. Now, wait a minute. That knocks your head off, doesn't it? I'm going to test your intelligence. I want you to think of nations now. When I speak of a bald eagle, what nation do you think of? When I think of a bear, what nation do you think of? Russia. When I think of a lion, what nation do you think of? Great Britain. Things haven't changed that much, have they? Except in vision, Daniel saw these beasts. And he says in verse 17, these are kings, four of them. And by the way, they correspond to the four sections of the image of Daniel 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Are you following me? In Daniel 2, you saw one aspect. In Daniel 7, you see another. In Daniel 2, the political aspect. In Daniel 7, the religious aspect. And Daniel says, they were like four great beasts. I don't have time to go into all of them. I want you to notice that this fourth beast was dreadful and terrible, with iron teeth. The legs of iron represented Rome in Daniel's vision, Daniel chapter 2. And it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it says, it was diverse or different from all the other beasts before it. If you read on, it says that this last beast had ten horns. Ten horns. These ten horns were ten kings or ten divisions. Are you following me? A horn represents the leader. The ten divisions of the Roman Empire. When Rome fell, Rome was divided into ten divisions. Remember that from Daniel 2? And there were ten kings over these lesser nations. And Daniel said in chapter 2, Never again would one kingdom rule the entire world. But they would be part strong and part weak. And we ended that verse, that chapter with a verse that said, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there was the first kingdom... Babylon, the second kingdom, Medo-Persia, represented by the bear. The third kingdom was Greece, represented by the leopard. And the fourth kingdom, with the iron teeth, was Rome. And then came the ten horns, or the ten divisions of Rome, with ten leaders. And it refers to these great powers. 
In verse 11, we discover the judgment of God upon this last power. And in verses 13 to 14 of Daniel 7, he describes again the glorious and triumphant coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to read again verse 17. It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now listen to verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. Verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. You see, if you let the Bible explain itself, it's not so difficult after all, is it? Rome was divided into ten parts. Remember the ten toes of the image of Daniel 2? The ten kingdoms of Europe as we see them today. The Angles and Saxons became England. The Heruli became the Italians and so forth. The Franks became the French. The ten divisions of Rome. And verse 24 says the ten horns are ten kings. Now listen to what I'm about to read you. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. Very quickly now, ten kingdoms. Then Daniel kept looking at this vision, and another horn began to sprout. And in order for that one, now a horn represents a king, and in order for that one to come up, he had to uproot three. And ladies and gentlemen, the very next verse is the key verse. Daniel 7, 25. Listen now, and for three things. Listen now for three things. Speak, let me, let me read verse 24 so that you can tie into it. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Now you follow me now. Ten kingdoms. Then another kingdom shall arise different than the others. What makes him different? This next king that arises is different because he is not just the king of a temporal realm, he is the king of a spiritual realm. He's not only a political power, he is a religious power. And this makes him different than all the other kings that have ruled on the face of the earth. Now in order for him to take the throne, he has to uproot three kingdoms. When this power began to emerge, there was re revolution. There were some who said, no, we won't go along with it. And there were what were called holy wars. And the crusaders fought. And three nations were overcome in order for this power to emerge. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it was different in that it was not only political, it was spiritual. It would not only control the political lives of men, but the souls and the destinies of men. Are you listening to me? And the Bible says in verse 25, there are three distinguishing things about this new power. Number one, it would speak great words against the Most High. Number two, it would wear out the saints of the Most High. And number three, it would think to change times and laws. My beloved friends, there's only one power on the top side of the earth that fits the prophecy. And that is the Roman church. Now I want to tell you something. I'm saying this with a lot of compassion. The truth is never against people. It's against systems, against error against apostasy. Amen. Well, how did this happen? There was at first a dreadful attempt on the part of pagan Rome to step out Christianity. And they killed Christians by the hundreds of thousands. But Jesus has said to his disciples, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, the grave, shall not prevail against it. They will try to kill my church off, 
but the gates of the grave will not enclose my church. Now when you go back and read Josephus, Josephus said every time they killed ten, I'm sorry, every time they killed one Christian for his faith, ten would join. Well, why was that? The pagans feared only one thing, and that was death. They had slaves, the Romans had slaves, they had money, they had everything. And they would go out into the arenas to watch Christians die, as they were fed to wild animals and burned at stake and all these other things. And they went out there to watch blood and gore and fire. But what they saw was more than they bargained for. They saw Christians dying on their knees in prayer. They saw Christians dying with smiles on their faces. They saw Christians dying singing songs of praise. Faith of our fathers living still. We will be true to thee till death. They saw Christians die with peace. And these heathen, scared of death, were astonished by this. And when they got home, they couldn't forget it. The one thing we fear is death. And yet here are people who must know something because they do not die as cowards. They die singing songs and praising God. And they would go off into private places, find these Christians and ask. And those Christians would tell them, we can explain to you why we die like that. Our Savior Jesus died, but he also rose up from the dead. And he has conquered death. He looked back and said, oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Our Lord says he's got the key to death and hell hanging on the golden girdle of his loins. And even if we die, we're going to live again. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. And when these pagans heard it, they said, look, I want to die like that. And every time they kill one, ten join, says Josephus, who was not even a Christian. Finally, we came to Diocletian. Diocletian decided, I'm going to step out, stamp out this Christian religion. And the most severe persecution the church had ever known came between the years 303 and 313 A.D. But ladies and gentlemen, the more they killed, the more joined. And so many pagans joined the church that the balance of political power began to swing from pagans to Christians. And all of a sudden, there came an opportunist. His name was Constantine. You ever hear of that? His name was Constantine. Constantine came riding across the Roman Empire, declaring amnesty for Christians. He said, stop killing these people. And then he passed a law that everybody should worship on Sunday and not Judaize. And two years later, he faked a conversion and joined the Christian church. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I say he faked it because I had to do a, a thesis on Constantine in college. And every authority I checked said they believed it was strictly a political move. He saw the balance of power and a popular movement, so he joined it. And when Constantine joined the church, everybody came flowing in. Are you listening to me? And the leaders of the church had come in because of Constantine, not because of conversion. And they brought with them their pagan festivals. And then they had a problem. They had folks worshiping on two days. And they had a council and they had a vote. I'm going to show it all to you. The first law was the Constantinian law in 321 A.D. Two years later, in 323, he joined the church. In 538 A.D., they changed the Sabbath. You're going to see it now. Please cut off all the lights and follow me to the screen. And I want you to watch very carefully for the three things God said this power would do. All the lights off, please, including the spot up here. And I want you, please, to be able to listen to me very carefully as we go to the screen. Now, I want desperately to be able to read this screen. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, heathen have always worshipped the sun. It goes all the way back to Nimrod, all the way back to the Tower of Babel. The sun has been the supreme idol god. Now, the earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday as a legal duty 
is from the Constitution of Constantine in 321 A.D., enacting that all courts of justice, inhabitants of towns and workshops, should be at rest on Sunday, and he named it Venerablis Deus Solus. Uh, that's Latin, and I'd like to quote it in English. Venerable or holy day of the S-U-N. And that comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. You can go to your library and read it. By the way, beloved, you don't have to get this from an Adventist preacher. You can go to the Library of Congress and read everything I'm showing you. It's there. Now, Daniel 7.25 identified a power that would arise in history, or in the future that is, and would do three things. Speak great words against the Most High, wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. I want to see what power fits that prophecy. First of all, speak great words against the Most High. In 1439, at the Council of Florence, it was said... We define the Roman pontiff, successor of blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, true vicar of Christ. Vicar means substitute or replacement. Now the pontiff is the pope. And the church said the pope is the substitute of Christ. Jesus said, however, when I go away, I'm going to send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost. But here a man says, no, we have a man who is Christ's substitute. From the great encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII, that's the Pope that Martin Luther had so much trouble with, the Protestant, he said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. He shall speak great words against the Most High. Here is another from the Catholic National it says the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of the flesh. The Bible, no, no, please be charitable. People believe this. But the Bible declares that the vicar of Christ is the Holy Ghost. Amen? Not a man. Let's go on now. The second thing, oh, by the way, I could put dozens of things up there. I just wanted to give you a taste of the prophecy. He will speak great words against the Most High. And the Bible says that blasphemy is when a man claims the prerogatives of God. That's what blasphemy is. Now, the second thing he would do is wear out the saints of the Most High. Good Pope John 23 came along and made quite an impression on the whole world. He was a man of the people. And once in an interview, Pope John 23 said, There is a dark chapter in our church's history that we all wish we could forget. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to get this out here. What do you think a Protestant is? What do you think the word means? If you knew what your, your pioneering fathers went through in order to break the band of this world dominion and set up the Protestant churches... You would be alarmed. Men paid with their lives. In John 16, 2, Jesus said, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And it happened in the church. Revelation 13 agrees with Daniel 7. It says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. To make what? to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him of all kindreds and tongues and nations, referring to this same apostate power. Ladies and gentlemen, Christians went into dungeons and rotted there, never seeing the sunlight again for the rest of their lives. Young women who embraced the Christian faith were brought to trial and urged to recant. Some of their hands were held in fire until they cried out and shrieked in pain. They were ordered to recant or take it back. Go to your library and read it. Look up the Spanish Inquisition. Look up the Huguenots, the Albigenses, the Waldenses. Look it up in the library and read it. Get a book there written hundreds of years ago before there was ever such a thing as most of us. And you will read Fox's Book of Martyrs. How 50 million people were put to death by the church. All that was needed to put them to death was that they be branded a heretic. 
A heretic then was shut out from grace according to the church. He could not be saved and he could be put to death as evil. People rotted away in these cells. Some of us have traveled in Europe and we have seen these cells. They're still there. There is a palace right near the Vatican itself on the Tiber River. And inside that palace there is a museum and they still have the implements of torture there. A few years back, they were photographed and came out in a popular family magazine. People were burned at stake for their faith in Christ. The great Colosseum of Rome was the scene of many of these terrible, terrible massacres where Christians were eaten alive by lions, wild animals, simply because of their faith. And the galleries filled the stands just like the people do at the Redskins games. And as they saw these animals ripping people apart, they burst into applause and laughter. It is that sad chapter that Pope John 23 spoke about. It first happened under pagan Rome, but it happened ten times worse under papal Rome, fulfilling the words of the Bible that he shows wear out the saints of the Most High. Men and women were burned at stake, lighting the night skies with their scorching flesh. Hot tar was poured down their throats. Some were trampled to death by elephants and other wild and ravenous beasts. And at night when the stands emptied, the bodies of Christian dead littered the place, and only God had honor for them. It's very difficult for you to see this. Pastor Willis is in that crowd somewhere. This is in Torre Pellici, Italy, the home of the Waldensians. He and I went there in 1975 together. And at a museum there in that little Waldensian town, the curator with a stick in his hand is pointing to a mountain. That's a, a relief of a mountainous terrain. And he is pointing to a mountain where his people ran to hide from their Roman oppressors. And they ran into a cave. And finally someone betrayed them and told the Romans where they were. And these people who were members of the church came and built a fire and smoked them out and killed them one at a time as they fell to their deaths in the valley below. Ladies and gentlemen, unspeakable crimes were perpetrated upon the people of God. This slide represents a man hanging up by the hands. It is a picture that hangs in that museum of the Waldensians in Torre Pellice, Italy. I photographed it with available light. It's not a very clear picture. And, 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 and my projector man, if you lift up the back of that projector, you'll let the photo down a little bit. Would you do that, please? And you see this man, just lift up the back of the projector please. There you are. You see this man actually hanging up there, and there is a priest standing there urging him to give up his faith. He would not give it up. He would hang there until finally in their wrath they would put him to death. They did all kinds of things, and it was all done publicly, and it continued for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In England, uh, Ridley and Latimer died, but before that, John Huss, John Huss, was burned at stake and his ashes scattered on the Rhine River in Germany only because he wanted to keep the commandments of God. They burned him at stake, buried his ashes, and then dug them up and scattered them on the river. And now we come to this side representing Ridley and Latimer in England. You see, the Roman church ruled the whole world. And wherever men would not bow down to their dogma, they were persecuted and put to death. Jerome Savanarola spent his years in a prison cell where the ceiling was so low he could not stand up. He had to either lie down or kneel for years as they tried to drive him out of his faith. Martin Luther was the first really successful reformer. And when he went to trial at the Diet at Worms, he was ordered to recant by Charles V of Germany. Luther asked for time to pray, and he went into a little room, and the historians say he looked up toward heaven and said, Lord, I am but a child, not knowing how to go out or to come in. Help me now, and give me the courage and the grace to do right. They brought Luther out and stood him before the king, and the king said, Martin Luther, do you recant? 
Luther said to him, Sir, these things I have accepted from the Word of God, they are a matter of conscience. To deny them is both dangerous and foolish. Here I stand. I cannot. I will not recant. Lord, have mercy on my soul. As soon as Martin Luther said that, Charles V of Germany ordered him excommunicated from the church. That meant he was not only put out of the church, but he couldn't go to heaven when he died, according to them. Then he was subjected to papal anathema, which meant his life wasn't worth a dime. Whoever killed him would be rewarded, and whoever gave him shelter would be punished severely. As a matter of fact, Charles V said, whoever sheltered him would also be subjected to papal anathema and excommunication. And at that trial was Duke Frederick of Saxony, who was like Luther's uh, immediate governor. Duke Frederick ordered his own men to kidnap Luther. And they took him out into the forest, into a palace, a castle that belonged to Duke Frederick. Luther thought he was a prisoner until he began to receive the good treatment. And the Bible was made available to him. He didn't know who his benefactor was for a long time, but he was getting the best of treatment. He had books to study, and he had the Word of God, and Luther was a scholar. So while he was out there shut away as though in jail, he decided to do something. He decided to write the Word of God back into the language of the common people. And when Luther got his Bible ready, bless God, another German by the name of John Gutenberg had a printing press ready. Don't you see how God works? And when Luther's Bible was ready, instead of men having to painstakingly write it by hand, they put it on the printing press, began to turn out the word, and scatter it all over Germany. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And as the people began to read the word of God, they saw that the word was right and the church was wrong and the stranglehold of the Roman church was broken. The Protestant Reformation got underway. Would you say amen out there? When they killed Ridley and Latimer, they built the fire. And those two men had to talk to each other amidst the howling of the mob. And Latimer said, play the man, Brother Ridley. It may be that on this day we shall start a fire that will light a light throughout Europe. These men died for their faith. And then the Bible says, number one, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Number two, wear out the saints of the Most High. And number three, do what? Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm about to show you, the church doesn't mind you knowing. The other day, I spent about nine hours with a priest, a good guy. Oh, we had fun. We made it clear in the beginning. I was Charles, and he was Pete. Fine fellow. We had fun together. But in the course of our conversation, he said, Charles, what does your church teach? I said, well, we hold in common with most Christians many things, but there are some distinguishing features. For instance, we obey the Bible Sabbath. He said, why do you do that? I said, because we know that your church changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and we do not accept the authority of your church. Oh, he said, Charles, we just did it in honor of the resurrection. I said, well, if that's why you did it, show me a text and I'll do it. And there was no anger, no wrath, no rancor between us. They don't mind you knowing. Now, I promise to tell you who did it, and here it is. And by the way, all of this is authenticated. You can go to your library and read it. Go look up Sunday and read it. Now, first of all, at the Council of Laodicea in 364, that's 364 years after the Lord. Would you say amen? Folk talking about the resurrection. Christ had been in heaven 360 years, almost. You follow me? Over 300 years, Christ has been back in heaven when they had this council. Now, let me read to you. This is what they said at the council of Laodicea. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on, the, on Saturday, but shall work that day. But the Lord's day, they shall... I can't read that. Yeah, exceptionally honor, and as being Christians, as far as possible, do no work on that day, 
And if they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Let's move it over this way, Bill. Yeah, maybe I can read it better. All right, let's go to the next one now. This is the Catholic Mirror. The Catholic Church, for over 1,000 years, before the existence of a Protestant, that was before there was ever such a thing as a Baptist, or a Methodist, or a Calvinist, or a Lutheran, or a Wesleyan, or anything else. When they ruled, they didn't allow any Protestants. Is that clear? Now, the Catholic Church says in their newspaper that the Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Christian Sabbath, Saturday, Sunday, is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church without one word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. That's where it came from, beloved. All these little excuses about, well, you know, the Lord rules on you can forget it. This is where it came from. All right, here is another. The president of Redemptorist College, Father Enright, says, It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day of the week. You can go to your library and read it. You don't need it from me. From the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Free Press, Father Jeritzma said, Now every child in school knows that the Sabbath day is Saturday, the seventh day of the week. Yet with the exception of the Seventh-day Adventists, all Protestant denominations keep Sunday instead of the Sabbath day because the Catholic Church made the change in the first stages of Christianity. They don't mind me telling you this. They acknowledge it freely. Reverend Stephen Keenan says in Doctrinal Catechism, incidentally I have this catechism in my library, Question, have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. That's from a doctrinal catechism, third edition, page 174, I believe it says over there. You can read it yourself. Go to the library. It's there. All right, Father Enright of Redemptorist College said, It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to the seventh day to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but at the Council of Laodicea in 346, anathematized those who kept the Sabbath and urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. 300 plus years after the resurrection. That's clear, isn't it? Would you say amen? amen? All right to say amen. You don't have to do what you don't want to do. But I want you to be clear. Now here is a letter in Father Enright's handwriting. And he said, I hereby offer $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound on the pain of grievous sin to keep Sunday holy. That's what a Catholic priest said. And that ought to shock you. The other night, I promised $200,000. Somebody said, Pastor Brooks, you don't have $200,000, do you? I said, man, you know I don't have $200,000. But it doesn't make any difference. I can offer $200 million. Would you all like a bigger offer? I offer $500 billion. And you know what, beloved? I don't need any money because you ain't coming up with any text. Say, man. Not even a hint. Amen. Now, beloved, I'm not trying to be overpowering. You notice tonight, I'm just teaching. I do it with compassion. I kept Sunday. My granddaddy was a Methodist preacher. Three uncles were. My brother-in-law is today. He's one of my best friends. We're not against people. But we have to tell you the truth. God would hold me responsible if I didn't. And, and, and I can't let you go on saying, well, they interpret it one way and we're not. There is no interpretation. The Roman church changed the Sabbath in the 4th century A.D. You know, the 300s is the 4th century. Like the 1900s, the 20th century. In the 4th century A.D., the Roman church changed the Sabbath. And people will say to me, Pastor Brooks, you know I enjoyed your sermons until all at once you came up with something new. My answer is, new? 
The Sabbath goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. How much older do you want it than that? This Sunday business is new. Amen. It came hundreds of years after Christ. Thank you for the spot. You may take it off. Let's go on, Bill. I want to show them just a few more things because I'm running out of time. When Luther had his tremendous debate with the Roman church, it was with the learned Dr. John Eck, the most scholarly mind in Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. His opponent said, the church has had power to change the Sabbath of the Bible into Sunday. If you turn from the church to the scriptures alone, then you must keep the Sabbath, which has been kept from the beginning of the world. Would you folks say amen out there? Now this is the fellow who debated with Martin Luther before there was ever such thing as a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever you are, and I am. Amen. He said, the church has the power to do this. And if you go to the scriptures alone, you cannot find anything except the Sabbath, which was kept from the beginning of the world. You can find that in your library. Here's another from the Hartford Weekly. That's in Hartford, Connecticut, February 22, 1884. Catholics say that church changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and all the world bows down and worships upon that day in silent obedience to the mandates of the Catholic Church. Amen. Just want you to acknowledge it. Father Brady, Catholic, says, It is well to remind the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. That's what a Catholic priest says, beloved. All right, here is one from the Decretals of Gregory. Gregory was a pope. And from his Decretals, Book 1, Title 7, Chapter whatever, I guess, that Chapter 3 over there, it says, For he, the pope, can dispense with the law. He can turn injustice to justice by correcting and changing the law, and he has the fullness of power. I just don't believe that. The Bible said that a power would arise that would think to change times and laws. And here a pope said, we've got the power to do it. But the Bible does not say it, and I believe the word of God. What about you? And so there, beloved, is your answer. Who changed it? The church did. Now don't turn against people. Don't turn against Catholics. God's got some wonderful Catholic servants. Amen. Living up to all the truth they know. And one day before Jesus comes, they're going to hear his voice. And they're coming out of Babylon. Let's say amen out there. Oh, yes, sir. John 10, 16 says, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Christ is sending out the message today. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Now, ladies and gentlemen, man changed the Sabbath. You've got a choice to make. And I want you to read this with me now. This is in your Bible, and you ought to write it down and put a star beside it. Matthew 15, 9. Jesus is talking. And Jesus says, but in, but in what? Now, I'm not going to go through this one fast. I'm finishing my sermon right now, and it's time. But I want to make sure you get this. Matthew 15, 9 in your Bible, Jesus says, but in. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of All of you who believe that the leaders of the Roman church are men, say amen. amen. You don't really believe that that man is a god, do you? No. Now, we're not knocking people. We're talking about a system. Difficulties in the Breath of Life sound system prevented the recording of the last few minutes of this powerful message. On behalf of the Breath of Life team, we would like to express our apologies.